celebration. It's a day of learning. It's a day of PD and the PJs. Uh, it's a day where we as an education community get to come together and learn together. So uh, before we get started, I just wanted to quickly show you a few ways of how you'll navigate um, our work together today um, and also how you'll connect with presenters and with each other. So you'll use, the best place is our main website, uh, the uh, gathering.theeducatorcollaborative.com. Um, if you're not able to access the website, then follow us on Twitter, at the Ed Collab. And from that Twitter stream, we will send out direct links to uh, video pages all day long. But if you are able to join us on the gathering page, um, the best place to go is the agenda. If you head over to the agenda, you can see the full list of all the amazing people who are presenting today. And all you have to do is click on the link and any session that you'd like to see, you'll be taken right to their page and the video is embedded inside of it and will play automatically. If you have any trouble today, we do have a little help button here um, where we're gonna suggest the things that I would suggest to you too. Um, double check your Wi-Fi connection, um, Refreshing helps a lot. Just refresh your page and the video uh, will hopefully start again. Very worst case scenarios, follow us on Twitter or also click down here to a mirror site that doesn't have all the bells and whistles of this one, um, but does allow you to go directly to videos. And probably the most important thing to know of all is that everything's recorded today. It's all archived. Uh, everything that, that uh, you will see, all of our presenters, um, all the sessions are here and will be here for months and months and then they move over to our YouTube channel. So worst case scenario, if you miss something live, uh, you can always catch it there. Then in addition to that, all day long we invite you, and a lot of you have been doing this already, um, we invite you to tweet along with sessions. And so the way that that works is you can use, always use hashtag the Ed Collab Gathering. Um, that Twitter hashtag right there will let you connect with everyone who's here. Um, then for each of the individual workshops, so starting in session one through session four, so all of these workshops all day long, all of the workshops are numbered. And if you'd like the presenters to uh, see the tweets that you're sending to them, then do hashtag the Ed Collab Gathering, include a space, and use hashtag and the number of the session. On each one of the session pages, we have the exact hashtag and number that you'll need to use right there on the top of the page above the video. So it should be pretty easy for you to find. Um, if, all, if all else fails, just do hashtag the EdCloud gathering and, and we, we still will see you. We're very happy to, uh, to have you here in, in any, any way, shape or form that we can. Um, but by using that number, um, that will allow uh, presenters to be able to see you and connect with you and, uh, and know that you're there for us too. Um, so for today, oops, sorry, let me drop on this. Um, so for today, uh, uh, I'd like to start with uh, us, us thinking about something um, kind of big. I, I normally start the day by saying, you know, here we are together today. Uh, that it's a day full of joy, um, which certainly it is. But but I'd like to start with just some uh, thinking as well. So educators are people. We are humans. We are humans with concerns and love and identities and families. And uh, there's so much that make us human. And too often as educators, we can walk into our school building or our classroom and feel either by choice or by pressure of society or of the culture in our school that we need to let go of those parts of ourselves, that we may need to let go parts of our identity or or the things that make us laugh, or the people that we love, or the families that we're in, there are times where we have to, or feel like we need to let go. And what I want to suggest to you today as we're getting started, is that one piece of your humanity that right now you can't let go of, we can't stop being, is political. Because if you are not political, everything that is happening around us will become predictable. It sometimes is uncomfortable to stand for the things that you stand for or to support the people that you support or to say the things that you believe, but right now too much is becoming predictable, that can't be. So a message I'd like us to think about as we move into today is how important it is 
that we hold on to that piece of our humanity, even when it feels scary. Um, many of you may have seen uh, Kelly Miller. She is now the former, she just resigned, um, the former county campaign chair for the Donald Trump campaign, um, and also an elector to the Electoral College while she was in that role. Um, and if you haven't seen this video, um, uh, Kathy, and Kathy's not the first, nor will she be the last, but Kathy is someone who on video to The Guardian um, said that uh, racism didn't exist before President Obama and that um, all the problems that she's seen in cities and in the world today never existed before. And while it might be easy for uh, me to feel judgmental about that and to be upset about that, um, the thing is Kathy possibly is lying, possibly is saying something that, that, that has been fed to her, possibly is using, using a, a line that she's heard, but also it's very possible that Kathy's awareness about people that aren't like her or other people who might say something like that, it's possible that they're really not aware, that they really don't see what's happening around them. And so people like Kathy will make statements like Kathy did and, uh, our children will continue to be raised in a world where depending on the color of your skin, um, you might have to fear interactions with police or you might have to believe that you are not valued. I had an amazing conversation with um, Debbie Reese uh, just, just a few days ago um, where, where we were talking back and forth and, and she shared a lot about um, uh, research around the native people and children who drop out of school, the suicide rates amongst Native people, um, and how continually around them they live in a world that doesn't believe in who they are and misappropriates their culture. So we've had murders this week. Um, Terrence Crutcher, Keith Lamont Scott are just two names that have been added to an incredibly long list of names that can't even fit all on this card. And people have died and we're aware of it. And part of us being aware of it is that people are being political because they don't want this to be predictable. Movements like Black Lives Matter, for example, whether you like it or not, are here to raise awareness of people that we've lost. Now, the uh, Sioux uh, at Standing Rock are joined together with hundreds of other tribes that are coming together to stand in place of a pipeline being built across their graves and across their water and through their land because they don't want it to be predictable. They're being political. And because they're being political, we know about it and we talk about it now. And it's even in our news. This issue at Standing Rock has been going on for quite some time, but now people like me, a white educator, is aware of this. These things are alive inside of our conscious and whether you're comfortable with it or not, they're here because people are deciding that they can't make it predictable. So today, one thing I'd like you to think about is how you can support the people who are doing this work, who are trying to make the predictable no longer predictable and share their experience connect with people on Twitter that you don't normally connect with, have conversations that you maybe don't normally have, push yourself to listen, push yourself to support. And those of you that are already doing this incredible work, and there are so many of you, um, continue and we got you, we, we have your back. Um, along the same line of being political, um, one thing that we believe very strongly in uh, for our gathering is today is a day of, um, of free PD. <laughs> you're here, you didn't have to register, um, you're able to join all day, you'll have access to these videos forever. Um, and we did that on purpose because uh, we want this to be a gift to our, our great community. Um, but along with that, you normally probably would have spent something on registration or you would have um, you know, gone and had a cup of coffee or lunch. And so one way that we've always tried to be political and we need to continue to be political is we ask you during every gathering to please pay forward what you would have paid for a day like this. So uh, today, 
our adopted cha charity, and we always ask our opening keynote to choose the charity to adopt. So today our adopted charity is Casa for Children, Court Appointed Special Advocates. Um, this is a charity that organizes um, volunteers, um, legal uh, personnel, um, and just everyday people like you and me to support children who have dealt with trauma, who are in foster care, um, who are trying to move through a system of adults that is trying to support a system of children but doesn't often do that in the best way. Um, I'm going to, in just a moment, uh, uh, move over to, to Catherine, our, our keynote for today. Um, and Catherine will tell you much more because she selected this charity. But if you'd like to give to this charity, and we ask that you please do, you please consider that, or please spread this charity to others, especially for today as we um, adopt it. If you go onto our main page in the top left corner is a button you can click on the gathering page that has our charity for today that will take you directly to that charity's main page. Um, it's another way that you can be political so that um, children's lives are protected. And with that, being political is not just because we have an incredibly contentious election happening in the US right now. Um, it's not just because um, uh, you know, people outside somewhere are being affected. It's because our children will someday be adults and we are raising future adults. So us choosing to be political to expand our own bubble, to listen to voices that we don't normally listen to, and then especially to speak up and amplify and act, we're showing children the sort of world that we want them to inherit. It's no longer a time where we can just sit idly by and wait. People are dying on the streets. Our kids are dying on the streets. We need to do something. Um, so with that, I'd like to, uh, go from CASA for children uh, and move over to inviting our, uh, our guest for today. Um, Catherine Bomer, uh, through all of her work, shares her heart and joy and her belief in children. Um, she, uh, behind me on my shelf here, I have a number of her books, including Hidden Gems, where um, she, she invites all of us to find the beauty and strength inside of all children and all children's work. Um, and to go from a place of, of hope and strength. In her newest book, The Journey is Everything, which I have to tell you, I've now read literally twice. Um, it started as plane reading, and uh, on an airplane reading, and now um, I, I'm starting it over again. Um, the Journey is Everything, Catherine uh, uh, rethinks the way that essay works in all of our lives, um, which she'll go into in just a moment. And what, what I particularly, um, love and, and cherish about this book, in addition to many things, um, is that Catherine uh, invites you to think about how essay tells a piece of yourself and tells a piece of your journey to others. And being political is also doing that, telling your life, um, telling people what matters to you, and then engaging with people who are doing the same. So um, Catherine, if you're here with us, you can uh, come unmute, unmute your mic, unmute your camera. Um, and we'll, we'll bring you over. Uh, so I, I, oh, here she comes, hi, Catherine. So I am, I'm so honored, so excited to uh, have Catherine Bomer here with us today. Um, and uh, Catherine, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you. Oh, you just muted. Hello. There, Hello. <laughs> okay, perfect. I, I got so emotional from your uh, opening remarks that I had to uh, turn my, camera back off and get the tissue out again. Um, I honestly have never had uh, something, right before I presented, I have never had something so uh, important said. Not about me, I mean just about the world. Um, so thank you for being you, Chris, for being so brave to be uh, live on, and then on going live to the world on YouTube saying those remarks. I, I'm going to send everyone I know, whether they're educators or not, to that opening um, speech that you just made. Uh, I thank you. And thank you for inviting, oh, thank you for inviting me to, to this, uh, the coolest hangout on, on air, online, as far as I know anyway, for educators. Um, I'm coming to you today from Austin, Texas, where it is a mm, muggy 80 degrees, and we can look forward to 
going up to 90 later today. And so even though I know this is uh, the PJ in your pajamas thing, I'm not in my pajamas, but I am so happy to not have to wear shoes. <laughs> I will tell you that. <laughs> we don't wear shoes here in Austin, Texas. Um, so today, oh, I also want to thank Carolyn Hilarious, who is a, li a literacy coach in Kuwait and took her own personal time with her own personal children in the background at times um, to help me navigate this journey of technology. It's my first live Google Hangout, and she just is my tech goddess. Uh, <laughs> from now on, Carolyn, if you're listening, um, just know that you are, are now my best friend best friend forever <laughs> and I also want to thank teachers all of you who might be up early like I am or if it's your afternoon um, and coming in from wherever you had been before or if it's your evening um, deciding to join this wonderful opportunity to hear amazing people talking about how to help children's lives how to help kids um, navigate the journey of education and especially literacy education. So I wanted to say just a couple more words about CASA. Uh, it, is a, it is a charity that is near and dear to my heart, an organization that is near and dear to my heart because it is about, uh, well Chris told you that uh, it, is, it is for children who are in, in the court system and um, talk about trying to navigate <laughs> something very, very uh, labyrinthian. And you know, so many children don't have someone to speak for them. They don't have someone to who really knows them. Um, they may they have a, a lawyer, court appointed lawyer perhaps, but they don't have someone who actually knows them. And so, adults who volunteer for Casa actually spend time. They commit to spending a year with the child. Um, you know, whenever they can meet across a year, to really get to know that child, to understand who he or she is, to um, to understand what is happening in that child's life, and and especially what that child wants, and I, I could tear up right now thinking about it. Um, I I have a friend who volunteers for Casa, and she she told me about um, a child that that sh she uh, helped navigate the court system, and when and and the and the, the adult volunteer stands before the judge and says these are the things i know about this child and these are the things that sh she would like for her life and the, and my friend then turned it over to the child and uh, and that child got to speak with her own voice saying what she thought would be the best permanent home for her 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 forever adoptive home so uh, <laughs> having having people who will stand up for children that way and, and then to turn it over to their own voices is about the most amazing thing I can ever think about. I can't volunteer myself for CASA because it does involve a lot of time and, and mainly consistency with, with the child that, you're, uh, that you are working with. And I'm you know all over the, in airplanes all the time going somewhere so I can't give a child that consistency. But I tell you what, when I retire, that is, what I plan to do, and in the meantime, I can donate. Um, I can donate to the organization, which I hope all of you or any of you would 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 possibly consider that. It, it all helps. Everything helps. So, speaking of children having a voice, that is really the the heart and soul of what I'm talking about today. Um, I'm talking about. Uh, a little bit about thinking, writing to think on the page, uh, and I'm also talking about a little bit about essay, um, a kind of essay that's different from what we, we might think of uh, in essay, but really what I'm talking about, like the bottom line thing that I'm talking about is voice, children's voice, and you know, we are, we're always talking about adding voice to student writing and, and how important that is. It's on all the rubrics and all the states <laughs> for, for writing to have voice. And but the thing is, we th often think about adding voice being a matter of, um, you know, juicy adjectives or sparkle words or, you know, those, those wow words that, that stand out from the rest of it. And the, the problem is that's just an add-on, that's just adding in words. And instead, really, how you discover voice in writing is uh, by writing. You know, writing your voice unfolds. As your writing, um, as your writing is an act of discovery, as Donald Murray has taught us. Um, so my focus for this talk is about the importance of using writing as a tool for thinking, for thinking and writing, questioning, 
um, feeling, trying to figure things out, uh, stating things that make you angry. <laughs> and it's such a, it's actually like a super tower, super power tool, <laughs> a super power tool because you can use writing to think in all subject areas, math, science, social studies, reading for, cert, for sure. And it just, it, it, it helps you kind of settle down and tune into your own thinking. That's a, a phrase from my husband, Randy Bomer, um, talks about being able, in writing, you need to be able to tune into your own thinking, to you know, listen to your brain, and how often do we have times and places to just stop? What am I actually thinking right now? Even if the thoughts are you know, chaotic, by writing them down, you're kind of letting them settle and see, and, and you can look, then you can look at your thinking and say, ah, that's what I'm thinking. So it's just a, an incredible tool, and especially for ultimately writing something, we're back to talking about writing, writing to think helps you know what you wanna say, it helps you know how you feel or what you think about the world, what you observe, and ultimately that writing to think is so much sounds like what true essay is that it leans really easily into a more um, finished essay. I can go through drafts and revision and editing, of course, into a fi finished essay. So that's why I'm so excited to be talking about writing to think today. Um, writing to think is also about feeling at ease with writing. And again, think about your own self, perhaps. I mean, I often don't feel at ease with writing, even though I write every single day. And I've written a lot of things in my life. I still must say, you know, it's a, it's a heart-stopping <laughs> activity sometimes. And uh, so it's it's about but I think that's because of how I wrote or didn't write when I was young in school um, so now we have better tools and we can help children feel at ease and and fluent it's a matter of fluency just flu you know that the, that the words could flow onto the page and that you know you know if it's inside a writing notebook it's it's okay that it doesn't have um, correct exactly correct spelling and 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 exactly correct indenting of the paragraphs because it's it's in the writer's notebook. It doesn't matter at that point. It's it's all about being able to just blah onto the page and you know, just flow onto the page. I'm not going to use that other word that I just demonstrated with my mouth. Flow onto the page. Um, so it's so it, it's about feeling at ease. And I believe that when kids can feel at ease with writing, when they know that. You know, I just need to put down my first thoughts and then I can look back at those thoughts and I can change them and edit, revise them and I can edit them. And, and that gives them a strength that they can carry throughout their lives with writing um, on tests, in any kind of future writing uh, assignments or activities they need to do, and in college and for the rest of their lives, frankly. Um, so if, as if that weren't enough uh, of a you know, celebration of writing to think, I think it also um, just, we'll talk about essay in a few minutes, and again, I just think it makes such, such a lovely transition to essay, which actually is a journey of thought. It's The true essay is about circling around an idea or, or a relationship or, or a place or an object, um, writing about the concrete, like video games or camping or cats. That's you, I'm talking about you. Uh, or writing about the invisible, like um, air, <laughs> wind, fear, uh, secrets. <laughs> so um, probably in this talk, I'm going to be using writing to think and essaying <laughs> interchangeably. Because for me, they are so, so uh, married in my mind. So uh, I, I just want to say a word for primary teachers out there. Uh, I love you. I was a primary teacher also. I t I've taught um, all the grades but third. Somehow I missed third grade. <laughs> but I work a lot in third grade classes, certainly in the middle school and high school classes. And I teach a graduate course at University of Texas in writing. So I've got this whole, I feel like I have, you know, four years old to 95 in my head for um, thinking about this, this topic, about writing to think and essaying. And of course, I don't think that four-year-olds and five-year-olds and six-year-olds, maybe even seven-year-olds should be writing an essay necessarily, but uh, writing to think, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> that's how kids are thinking constantly as they're making their pictures and letters, you know, beginning letters and sounds and uh, labels and, and ultimately words. They're, they're doing tons of thinking, but, but they're thinking about how to put 
those things on the page, but they're also thinking about their meaning. I mean, I've never seen anyone so clear about what they mean to say as the little ones, the four and five and six year olds, they are absolutely, well, even two and three, because I've worked with even two and three year olds, are absolutely clear about what they're putting on that page. It may not be clear to us as decoders, but they are absolutely clear and they are thinking about it and whether they're telling a story or whether they're talking about their cat, they know exactly what they're saying and they put that down on the page. So um, I'm talking about all the ages and I have some samples from, from the little ones too today. Uh, and then because I also taught fourth and fifth grades, I know that that age group can write actually lovely, beautiful, powerful, uh, change your mind kind of essays. Um, I, I, I have samples of that too. So um, I think all ages can, uh, can think about this idea of writing to think and that being like a true essay. So let me share with you some thoughts about essay over on my slides. There. I'm hoping you can see that. Yes, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> How much in life is perfect? Come on. <laughs> um, so there's that first slide, just the title. You, which you've probably already seen, and also the hashtag for the Ed Collab Gathering, which I'm going to, you're going to be hearing all day long, and also my uh, personal Twitter account. So feel free to talk at us, with us, to us, in any of those modes. So the first thing I would love you to tweet, or you know, you could just talk to your your computer on the couch with your cup of coffee, or <laughs> or tweet us. But I would love you to think about this question, what does the word essay bring instantly to your mind? And I, I, here's what I want you to do, though, is I want you to be honest. You know, don't, don't try to just tell me what I might want to think. I mean, really, or let, you know, if you have a um, journey of thinking in your mind, yay. But what maybe what does the world think about essay? Like if you stop someone on the street and said, what is an essay? You know, what, what's something you think they would say? Just, just type a couple words into your, into your Twitter as you think about that for a second. And then I will continue while you're thinking of that. It doesn't take long to think about that, I will say, frankly, because um, essay is a very powerful form in, this, in the school systems, and mo many people who grew up in the United States of America and around the world have had to deal with the form of essay um, that I'm going to pretty soon <laughs> take apart. <laughs> So as you're doing that, I'm just going to move on to my lovely hand-drawn. <laughs> and, and Catherine, I have a few tweets here. Oh, say them. Um, sure. So Leanne is saying five paragraphs. Um, yep. Jeffrey saying boring. Um, Christine also five paragraphs. Um, Paula says essay brings to mind an assignment divorced from real writing. Oh, real life writing. Paula, go. Paula, go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. So you get it. You're all, what good students you, you are. <laughs> You're giving me exactly what I want. Um, so yes, exactly. And here is the form that many of us, well, if you're my age or older, this, this is probably a familiar little um, graphic organizer for you. And the problem was that, you know, it, when we were trying to do this in middle school and high school, we had to fill that, pyram that inverted pyramids and those boxes in first before we had even written to think about what we want to say. And that just makes no sense to me. It made no sense to me at the time. When I was a 15-year-old, I was already radicalized and they're saying, this does not make sense to me. So, of course, I wrote my big essay first and then made an outline. So my outline got a bad grade because it was late, but I couldn't make an outline before I knew what I wanted to say. So um, there are other templates. You, you just Google a essay how to write an essay, and I'm telling you, you will have more templates in different sizes and shapes, a colorful, uh, the shape of a hamburger, some of you are familiar with. There's plenty of te templates to help people write the five er uh, paragraph essay, but the problem is the five paragraph essay causes bad feelings for a lot of people, including four year old, uh, fourth graders, sorry, fourth graders. So this amazing teacher, uh, just incredible teacher, she'll be presenting with me at NCTE in November. Her name is Allison Smith. She teaches fourth grade in Blue Springs, Missouri. And she asked, she opened her essay unit right, right away at the beginning of the school year, asking kids, what 
comes to their mind when they think about essay. And so here are some of their answers. I mean, look, already they're nine years old and they're saying it's hard, it's something you do in high school, they think. You turn it into a teacher and it gets graded. It's a lot of writing. You know, I, are we going to have enough time? So they've already heard that it's a, often a timed activity. And um, I love that one of them says, makes my hand tired. That's the one I say, well, yes, that, that's what a writer's life is. I'm sorry, sometimes your hand does hurt. But um, she, Allison, just went through and put cro uh, X's through ones that she said, no, it's not going to be like that here. It may have to be, unfortunately, she has a little sad face over there. It may have to be assessed, but it's not, uh, I, I, it's something we have to do because it's school. But all the other things, it's not going to be what you think it is. You're going to really, really love essay in this classroom. And sure enough, they do. So let me talk for a minute about essay as uh, the kind of essay that we, we are, is famous and we don't like. And then I'm going to talk about essay as literature. So let me go back to my self. Bless you all for being so patient. <laughs> there I am, right? So... Um, so that infamous five paragraph essay, I just need to um, clarify, you know, a lot of people tell me, or, or, and it's a very hot topic right now on the internet. Uh, people have been blogging about it. College professors, Kim Zarens has a, a blog on NCTE uh, blog site that has gotten apparently 9,000 hits. <laughs> I know I'm one or two of them at least. And um, uh, Paul Thomas is also has a teaching and learning forum where he's been talking about the five paragraph essay and the true essay and uh, oh boy the comments are just so interesting because you know smart thoughtful comments where people think are asking you know but do, isn't it a good scaffold isn't it a good beginning step isn't it something that helps organized writing and we all we definitely want organized writing we don't want writing to be just all over the place and we can't make sense of it but there are a million more ways to organize writing besides the five paragraph formula because the part the problem you know the for one, for one thing kids hate it as you can see from uh, Allison's fourth graders they already think it's boring and they haven't even started yet um, but the other thing is that it it basically I think it stops thinking you know it's <laughs> it actually halts thinking because all you're all you're thinking about with that template is how do I fill in this temp how do I make it how do I make my writing fit that template you know so it's so number one the number one problem with the five paragraph essay is that it is not an essay it's not the form the beautiful form that Montaigne invented in 1572 um, and and that thrived has thrived across all around the world ever since and can, and is explodes on the internet on online journals and magazines and blogs this is a form that is alive and well and can literally change the world because it's so powerful or make you cry or make you laugh it and it has nothing to do with a five paragraph formula it has its own organic shape right so that's the first problem it's not actually an essay so maybe at least we could not call it an essay <laughs> that's my first that was my thesis statement in my book let's just not call all that stuff essay um, the second problem is it's just a confusing um, structure because it just it's like a mathematical algorithm actually it's you know where where does that thesis statement go uh, last sentence first paragraph and then I know I have to have topic sentences that first sentence of every body paragraph and what's the difference between a topic and a thesis after all and you know that <clears throat> You've had kids who've asked those questions, I hope. I certainly have. And the third problem with the five paragraph is that um, I think kids are just being dutiful. You know, they're dutifully filling in those, those pyramids and, uh, or whatever template we have, and they're, they're not actually thinking about what they have to say. They're not thinking about what they mean, what they're meaning to say. They're not thinking about the significance of their idea or topic. And that's what breaks my heart because I as I said earlier children have a lot to say and they mean what they're saying and they have a lot of significance to their words and their ideas so um, to become a fluent writer you know you have to accept in your in your mind what what's in there and and that's why writing to think is so important because you you have to just love what you're saying or you have to you have to accept, not, not love it, but you have to accept it. You have to say, this is what's coming out right now, but I know I can turn to it and, and make changes and make it better. And when we're writing the true essay, um, I want to show you 
those slides now. You already saw it, so it's cheating. <laughs> this is the slide I wanted to, to show now, is that the opposite, the difference between the five paragraph essay and the, tr I'm calling it a true essay, I just made that phrase up, um, or essay with a capital E, um, is, is that it, it's literature. It's not a template. It's not pyramids. It's literature. As great as a poem, as great as a, as a play, as, as any great fictional novel, it, it is literature. And so what, if it's literature, what does that mean? Well, the first thing it means is that it has voice. Literature has amazing voice, right? And it's the author's voice. And if you, read, if you fall in love with a certain author, basically you're, you fall in love with his or her voice. Um, you, you can't wait to hear what that person has to say again when, you're, when you fall in love with a certain essayist. You just, you'll read anything they write, like um, David Foster Wallace, famously brilliant, brilliant, brilliant essayist. And I would read any, well, I, I can't read anything he's written since. He's unfortunately not with us anymore. But uh, I would read anything he wrote, and I would read it again and again. I have to because it's really complex. <laughs> but it's so beautiful and so funny. And... I love his voice. And so um, the voice that comes out is the author's voice. And when you try to fit that voice into that structure of the pyramids, it just mangles it, right? It doesn't allow the way children think or talk naturally to come out. And so then, you know, when it's a mangled voice inside a, a, par a five paragraph, then we have to go in and add voice, which just makes no sense, right? <laughs> add in some juicy words that makes no sense. So um, essay has voice, the true essay. Essay definitely has stance or perspective. Um, it's, it's not a, typically an argument. That's a different form of writing uh, where you take a side and, and, and argue it and, and you think of the other person's side too. Uh, but this, you know, essayists definitely have something to say that you, you're not, you're not, uh, wondering at the end how this person feels so it absolutely has a stance and a perspective on life but it's a it's one that makes you want to keep reading it you don't want to just bristle and argue with the person right away um, because of their thesis statement you want to go on this journey of thinking with them and and sometimes at the end of it your stance or perspective is actually changed and finally I say literature is uh, essay is literature because it has an organic shape it has um, it, it 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 is shaped because of what you're trying to say, not because of um, a template. You know what? How does my content come out best? And that's the shape that it will take. And it does need to be organized, but it's organized by you know um, maybe the story of your thinking or something like that, rather than uh, the next body paragraph. So those are just some things to think about as we're talking about writing to think and essay as literature. Um, Donald Murray wrote this, I mean, I, I love this quote. It's in his book, Crafting a Life in Essay, Story, and Poem. And I, this is it. <laughs> why, why essayists write? Donald Murray says, the reason I write is simple, to surprise myself. I want to discover what I know that I didn't know I knew, to see a familiar object in an unfamiliar way, to contradict my most certain beliefs. I put the powerful words of thinking in, in red. Uh, so imagine inviting kids to surprise themselves and discover what they know that they didn't know they knew. I mean, how empowering is that for kids? Um, and even to contradict your most certain beliefs, that's just something most people don't set out to do when they write, but it is so important to do it in writing. Um, I'm not going to read these all. I'll just say, you know, when, you, when you're a reader of essay, these are some of the things you want from it. They're, they're humane things. They're human things. They're, they're things that readers want from any kind of literature, right? And it's hard to imagine feeling any of those things necessarily from a standard five paragraph essay. <clears throat> I've laughed at a few, I think, and, <laughs> and some kids can even make me feel, but uh, generally they sound pretty robotic and, and boring. Um, so I'm gonna flip back to myself again and talk about a bit more about writing to think. Remember, I'm using these terms interchangeably so that thinking and essaying are really the same thing. Moving over to myself again. 
to say uh, some more about writing to think is, um, you know, writing is hard. Don't tell kids that, <laughs> but writing is actually really hard. Um, it's, it, it, you know, it, for a lot of reasons. It's, and, and I've written a, t t a billion words in my lifetime and still I don't find it an easy task. And I, I just know that if the only way I can sit in my seat and, and put my fingers on the keyboard or my pen and my writing notebook is to know that I, I'm going to write to think on this page and I'm going to accept what is in my mind because I know that I can make it better and I may not even know what I'm thinking at this moment. I have to do this writing to think. And then, you know, whatever comes out of that, I can find something great and say, oh, there's my heart of my piece and I can put it on some draft paper and write some more about it and I can revise what's on that draft paper and I can then edit that draft. If I didn't know that that process exists, I definitely wouldn't write. I, I shouldn't say that probably, but I'm just so grateful for that process of writing. I'm so grateful for being able to write to think first before before uh, essaying, I mean, before writing a final essay. Um, so we want, uh, you know, we take big risks, and kids certainly take huge risks when they put words on the page. It's like they're saying, here, take my, uh, take the churning in my heart. That's a quote from a Brian Doyle essay called Joyas Voladuras, uh, the churnings of my heart. Take these, take my thoughts and ideas and my observations and here. Here, you can have them. Just don't stomp on them, please. I mean, that's how our kids really are. They're just like, please, please don't, don't write red pen all over this. Um, and so that's why we have to be ultra careful, like hyper careful, not to be hyper focused on grammar and spelling and proper formatting. Um, we need to really listen to what kids are saying on their page and sit with them in a conference and say, what are you meaning here? If you can't understand, if you, the reader, can't understand it, say, you know, what are you meaning to say here? And the child can say what they're meaning to say, and you can say, now, let's work on that, making that clear. So we, kids need to write for themselves first, right, to find out who their self is, their authentic self, before we come along and say, uh, now that's, let's spell that word correctly. Um, when I taught my fourth and fifth grade classroom in New York City, my kids said their two favorite units of study uh, for the whole two years that we were together were um, essays, believe it or not, and a writing for social action, which is another <clears throat> hugely powerful unit of study or year-long unit of study, frankly, for me, writing for social action. And I think the reason they loved these two units so much is because they were writing about ideas. You know, they were thinking, they were writing about important ideas. They felt so grown up. They felt like they were doing real world work. Um, and they, they knew that someone, eventually multitude audiences were going to read their ideas and not just Ms. Bomer with a grade book next to me, you know? Um, and I think that's why, uh, that's why they loved it so much. They got so excited about writing to think and sharing their ideas. Let me show you a few examples of writing to think because you know, what does it even look like and sound like is an important question. I know teachers have asked me, well, what, what does that actually look and sound like? Well, first of all, it uses think, words of thinking. Uh, you know, when you're thinking something, especially if you're thinking it out loud on, on, in the air or on the page, you, you use words like maybe and I don't know, it seems to me, you know, I used to think you use those kinds of words and the, the true essay, you can have those words in your essay because the reader is going along on a journey of thought with you and it actually helps them go on that journey with you if you have words, you know, you actually admit to not knowing something <laughs> or that you're just now thinking of something and you know, let me say what I'm thinking. So here's what it looks like in, uh, oh, well, we know what writing to think looks like. This is the poetess of Pompeii um, in uh, Pompeii, Italy, and uh, the first, from the first century AD. Look at that, she's definitely writing to think. She's thinking right there with that quill in her mouth, <laughs> the wax tablet. Um, this is Phyllis Wheatley, the first African-American book to be published in, uh, in the um, mid-1800s. Mid She's a poet, and look at that. This was on the frontispiece of her book. Her thinking, look at that ch chin on hand, uh, pose of thinking. So we know what it looks like physically, and I think it's fun to show kids with your own body or with images like this what it looks like to think. 
Um, for little kids, it looks like pictures, labels, words, letters. They are all tools for thinking. So here's one of my former uh, kindergartners, who, <laughs> Pasquale, who is thinking, definitely circling around the idea of coffee. Now, you may wonder, why is a five-year-old writing about coffee? Well, you know, it's New York City. Hey, <laughs> I think maybe he drinks coffee with his dad. I'm not sure. But also, he drinks coffee. I mean, he's writing about coffee because of my, his relationship with me. I am a coffee addict and all my kids know it and because I'm always coming in with coffee looking for my coffee in the classroom and so down at the bottom that's me you know saying coffee where's my coffee and me next to the easel where's my coffee so he's his whole piece is just about thinking about coffee and he wishes that for Ms. Bomer coffee could be flying you know flying across the sky in a dirigible or in the clouds it's raining down on me uh, this is a seven-year-old from, from Missouri, Blue Springs, Missouri, Ambrose, and he's writing to think about what he wonders. Where does God live? What made God? My goodness, these are deep questions. What job will I have when I grow up? How old will I be when I die? And you can imagine a seven, this is what's in a seven-year-old's mind when you let them actually think on the page. What will heaven look like? Do dogs have souls? <laughs> will I be a pro? And of course, the burning question that we all have, how did Ben Franklin die? I mean, this is this mind of a seven-year-old, and it's amazing. This is a fourth grader, uh, also in Blue Springs, who wrote in um, to think about Star Wars. And I had shared a piece of one of my former students, one of my former fourth graders, with him. And you know, check out Lisa Eichholz's amazing book, um, uh, Lessons. Lisa, Lisa, where are you? I'm so nervous. I can't think of the title right now. Um, Somebody tweet it, please. Lisa, I call it Less, uh, Lessons from Classmates. Yes? Um, I love her book. So I was sharing a mentor text of student writing with this fourth grade class, and look what this boy wrote. I feel that Star Wars has meaning and depth. It just screams out passion. It made me feel so true and extraordinary. It's not plain and dull. It made me want to jump into the book. It taught me how to be wise about my choices. It wasn't delicate and fragile. It was willing to get loose and be free. It taught me valuable lessons like, do or do not, there is no try, Yoda, right? And trust is a thing that cannot be earned, that can be earned, not bought. It helped me learn that evil never, never prospers and that sometimes we lose things that we care about, but to still be strong. We need people who, this is really moving me right now because of what you talked about, Chris. Uh, we need people who are willing to stand up for what's right. It helped me learn that I always should be on the side of good and never lean to the dark side. It makes me think, why am I not doing that? Wasting my time playing video games and TV when I could be helping others. Okay, I wanted to let you know that this was a try it. I said for five minutes, just seven minutes, just write whatever you're thinking about whatever you want to write about. And this is what this boy came up with. It's in my mind already an essay as is this one by a seventh grader. It's one of my favorite pieces of writing of all time. I use it in every location. Every day I think about what happens when I'm gone. Is it just like turning off a light or do I float on? Do I get reincarnated or do I live with God? I hate thinking about it, but it just comes or maybe unconsciously I like it, so I keep going back to it. That's, the, that's what it's like to think and write, by the way. You keep going back and back because you're obsessed by it. I think everybody wonders about this. Most religions cover this. Science keeps trying to find the answer. <laughs> I love that one. I don't think I'll ever know, but within my lifetime, they may figure out eternal life or body switching or maybe realistic space travel where weeks go by like days and decades like weeks, but maybe there is no answer, just nothing. <laughs> just sit with that, those words for, just sit with those words for a minute. Uh, a seventh grader is writing about reincarnation or asking the question of do we get in reincarnated? Do we go to heaven? What happens to us? I mean, this is the most important um, topic of in the world, right? The most important topic of life. People have beliefs about it, but we don't have answers. And that's why he's essaying about it in his writing notebook. I'm just going to let you look at those real quick, and I'm not going to talk too long about them because, first of all, the first three are very just foundational, 
foundational um, ideas for writing workshop. And especially to think, we need to give time, kids time to think. We need to guard thinking spaces in our classrooms. It's hard, but we need to not be rushing, rushing, rushing toward final products. I, I would say, if I ruled the world, I would say more time thinking in the notebooks and talking with each other and finding out what we think will just benefit everything in writing and in life. Um, of course, choice of what to write about. Of course, modeling with mentor texts uh, that are published, published authors, and definitely mentoring with um, other students, using them as mentors. And with your own writing, with your own essaying and your own notebook, um, we can encourage risk taking by not giving grades on writing to think, using the notebook as a centerpiece all year long, not just putting it away just because you're now you're um, working on capitals and periods, and using just little triads like I just showed, um, writing for five minute triad. Here's a try it, for instance. Just explore for a few minutes. What do you, you know, these things, these, these things that are life. What do, these are the things that make great topics for essay. So just explore in your notebook for five minutes, any one of these questions, and especially, of course, why. Why is that the thing that makes you angry? And Allison Smith, that amazing fourth grade teacher, again, she, she turned, um, it's these ideas, I call them hot spots. I talked about, you know, writing into the hot spot, something that makes you angry or, or um, worries you or fearful or um, gives you joy. And she turned that into this cool little quadrant. I love this so much. Allison Smith, awesome. And um, these are mine. These are not the kids, but she, ha she has those samples. Um, and I was just thinking about joy, what gives me joy, but also... Um, is gonna hurt me is my cat Misha it gives me so much joy but also I'm gonna be so so sad when he gets sick and you know eventually dies and my anger is I, that's definitely something I share with kids my anger at the unequal education opportunities in this country I just I could I feel a fire burning inside me when I think about it frankly it's not so much anger as fire that burns inside me I could write about it any day um, and then just basic life annoyances. I travel a lot, so just just recently, just getting so mad at people with their quote carry-ons, two suitcases, and filling up all the bins. You know, you know how it is. So these are just ideas that you could get get going on in your notebook, and they could ultimately turn into fantastic essays. Um, so I I want to think for just a second about possible mentor texts for essays with you. Where there, come back, come back. Um, and just for a couple of minutes, I'm just going to show a, a couple of books that I've used to help kids get this the idea of what the sound of writing to think is. And of course, I I often begin the whole essay unit of study or a writing to think study with this wonderful book. You all know this. What what to what to what do you do with an idea? By Kobe Yamada. I'm I think probably everyone has this book, but just the idea that. Um, that ha the having of an idea is 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 um, can be metaphorical. Like what what happens when you have an idea? You it grows bigger and bigger, and you start to find joy and color in it, and eventually perhaps uh, change the world with your idea. Um, with little ones, I like to use books like this. Sometimes we call these list books, but it's also just you know like an essay. I'm writing an essay about things I like. I'm reaching out to figure out all the things I like and just thinking about this and that thing I like. This book, oh my gosh, is so essayistic. It's Birds by Kevin Hankies. And it's just, um, I love it. He's just very, very simple, so simple, gorgeous artwork. And he's just by Laura Dronzek. And he's just, Kevin is just thinking about um, birds and what colors they are. And he even uses the words, I think. <laughs> There are even some green ones, I think. <laughs> it's so perfect for young ones, um, what, what it looks like and sounds like to think. Another kind of list book um, that I love, No One Saw, uh, Ordinary Things Through the Eyes of an Artist. And it's just by Bob Raks, Raksa, Rakska. Um, I'm sure that's not how to pronounce it. Uh, it's just different artists, like no one saw the world like Vincent van Gogh, no one saw the world like this artist, and no one saw music like, like this artist. Um, and again, just reaching out across the world for all these different ideas all around the idea of, of writing to think. Um, 
so those are some wonderful mentor texts. And of course, uh, with older kids, there are uh, so many good things online. And I'll just throw up a slide in a second about resources for older students online and in Best American Essays. Uh, so I want to just think with you um, at the end here. I want to think about the power of writing to think and the power of writing about what matters, the power of writing about an idea that could actually change the world. So sort of circling back to Chris's um, <laughs> brilliant speech this morning about what's happening in our world right now. Um, you know, kids writing about that, um, writing what they think about that and how the, the events that are happening in our world affect them, that kind of writing actually could change the world. People listen to children when, they're, when children are writing from their hearts and writing about what matters to them. People actually sit up and listen. You know, uh, I've had adults say that a child's writing has changed their minds. So, man, we need to encourage kids to write from the heart. All kids of all ages can write what they're thinking, write what matters most to them. And they need to find their you know, authentic self. Who, what is my authentic voice? And we can only get there from writing freely, you know, having the freedom to put our voice down on a page and not be all twisted up inside a template. So I want to end with just saying, um, I, want to, I want to refer you to a tweet. And I hope, Kate Roberts, in case you're out there somewhere, or you will be today sometime, if you could retweet your tweet that you tweeted a couple days ago about, you know, we, we can stop racism inside our spheres of influence. I love that phrase, Kate, this is our spheres of influence. We have a sphere of influence in our classrooms. We are growing children, as Chris said, we are growing children who are going to become adults in this world. So let's begin there, you know, having kids write about these things, having, hearing what they have to say, having discussions about what they're saying, and not worrying about it being perfectly formatted and passing tests. That's my plea so that we can send kids' voices out into the world. Thanks so much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine, so much. Um, I, I want to share as a thank you um, some of the uh, conversation that, that you've started online, and there's, there's a lot of it. Um, as I present over here, one second. Um, so some, some thoughts from folks. Um, First of all, this uh, Kim literally made me cry <laughs> um, just a short while into uh, Catherine starting. Kim says uh, she's going to donate in honor of her mom, who was a longtime CASA volunteer. Oh. I know. I So thank you, Kim, for Yay. sharing that. Um, Catherine Flynn, you discover voice in writing by writing. Sonia, an essay is circling around an idea. Um, Mary Howard, love this point from you, Catherine. I can't make an outline before I know what I want to say. Um, Tamika says, true essay is literature. It has voice, the author's voice. Um, absolutely true. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for uh, sharing, sharing your gifts with us today. Um, thank you for your book, all of your books. Um, and just, just thank you for how you are in the world. Um, I, I continually am so inspired by your generosity, not just here presenting, but uh, when I'm lucky enough to run into you at like NCTE or a conference somewhere, um, you, you lead with compliments always. Um, and it's not just because we should, but because that, that's who you are. So um, thank you, that, uh, it, it means so much that you were here today. Thank you, back at you, Chris. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, and so, thank you. And so um, just a few reminders as you're about to get ready to head off to this very massive day that's ahead of us that is so beautifully uh, started out here by Catherine. Um, first of all, and you hear this throughout the day, please do consider donating to Casa for Children. You can find again the link to that charity on our website, whatever you maybe would have spent on registration or hotels or travels or just a cup of coffee, um, even a dollar. Um, helps change children's lives. And thank you, Catherine, for uh, choosing this for us. Um, and, and a lot of what Catherine was, was talking about here is in her amazing book, The Journey is Everything. I saw online lots of questions that came up too, like, my kids have to take state tests, what do I do? Catherine addresses beautifully as she already has, has done here um, and more inside of that book. So please, please do um, uh, look for that. And then, sorry, just to 
forgive me while I move ahead in slides here. Um, uh, hello to the world. So uh, in this keynote, literally thousands of you are watching online um, as we see the, the numbers behind us. And uh, I kept adding countries to this list as more and more of you were logging in. So hello to all of you everywhere from Ecuador to Kuwait to Jamaica to Jordan to Guatemala to here in the US to Denmark and, and many of you like the UK that I, I neglected to add to this yet. Um, thanks for being here with us today. Um, so a few things. First of all, uh, at the end of today, we are so, so excited for our closing session. We are very honored that the International Literacy Association, ILA, some of you may have known them as IRA, um, now ILA, uh, has partnered with us and uh, they, this is their second year of honoring incredible visionary educators all under the age of 30. Um, they call them their 30 under 30 honorees. So at 3 p.m. Eastern uh, this afternoon, right here on our website, um, in the closing session, uh, we have a panel of, of some of their uh, honorees from literally around the world. Uh, I will be moderating that panel. We also have some members of ILA who will be here to uh, talk a little bit about um, what this, this honor means and how they select people that they select. They also will share how you can nominate amazing, incredible, under the age of 30 um, uh, uh, educators who are really literally working to change the world. So please do join us for that. I, I think it'll be the, the perfect end to what's already starting out to be an incredible day. So coming up in, in session one, it's choose your own adventure. But remember, everything's recorded. So you are able to choose where you want to go. So head back to our website or check us out on Twitter at the Ed Collab, and you can find us uh, tweeting some of these links out too. So quickly, because there's a bunch of them, Tani McGregor and Shauna Coppola will be in workshop one, sketch noting for engagement and deeper comprehension. I'm just gonna say I'm excited for that. I'm excited for all of these, so just forgive me as I just gush here. Um, workshop two, Jason Griffith and uh, Shanisha Clark are uh, co-members with me of NCTE's Middle Level Section Steering Committee, and I uh, was so happy to see them uh, uh, be interested in presenting today. Um, they will be joined along with uh, Alex Corbett, who is one of ILA's 30 Under 30 uh, honorees. You'll actually see him at the closing. And they'll be talking about ways that narrative can stick lots of forms of writing together. And that's for secondary. Um, K to eight, uh, Birkins and Yaris, yay! Jan Birkins and Kim Yaris will be talking off of their brand new book, Who's Doing the Work, and sharing some strategies, ideas, and big thinking from that. Um, workshop four, I am, I am excited for not only because it's inspiring, but because I need to know more about how to do this well. Um, uh, K to five teachers, uh, we invite you to head over there to, to have this whole cast of amazing folks, um, Tawana, Jamira, Sandra, and Deirdre, who are talking about inclusive education, making it work through collaboration. Um, my own children uh, are, are often in, uh, inside of in inclusive settings, and uh, I, I know how challenging and how rewarding a setting like that can be. So that's going to be an amazing session is specifically designed for grades K to five. And then three to five, we have students coming. Um, workshop five, Susan Bunner and her students will be talking about personalizing learning in the language arts classroom. And again, please uh, remember to donate to our charity for today. So thank you all for uh, kicking off the day with us. We look forward to hearing from you on Twitter all day long. Use the hashtag the Ed Collab Gathering. Um, and as Catherine said, and as we've started, um, we're raising future adults. So the lessons that you use today, add them into your political life, add them into the belief system that you have about what matters for kids. And we need you to act on it. We need you to act on it for our children. We need you to act on it if you're here in the United States for our country. We need you to act on it for our world. Um, so, so take what you're learning across today and add that um, to your political toolkit and then use it. Um, thank you all very much for joining us. We look forward to hearing and seeing from you all day long. Oh, last thing, if you are uh, in a group today, uh, we had suggested uh, across this last month that you might wanna hold a viewing party, um, please tweet us a photo of all of you hanging out together. That would be lots of fun, I think, for all of us. So use the hashtag, the Ed Club Gathering, and you can do whatever crazy thing you all do when you're together. Um, and please, please tweet that out. We'd love to see you and say hi. Um, all right. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks again to Catherine and uh, in, enjoy your day.